Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the very hectic end of the semester. So, and I know you're working on your midterm right now, so it may sound uh, kind of astonishing to start talking about the end of the semester, but we effectively have, uh, my, if my count is correct here, um, this week, next week, and the week after, and then we're done. So I've got quite a bit of um, material to cover. I've had kind of, I, I put this together for the seven weeks to be a little bit slower at the beginning and then kind of ramp up towards the end. And I, I know that may sound a bit kind of cruel, <laughs> but um, it is a seven week course. And it's, I think, uh, important to kind of put together a lot of the framework or as best we can in the first part, and then try to implement that to some extent for the second half. So I know you're working on your midterms. Um, some of you, I think, may have already submitted your midterms, but this week-ish is, or um, actually, I think last week was the official deadline for the midterm. So, of course, if you haven't finished it, you can still turn it in. We still have a very flexible um, schedule when it comes to that. The, um, type this into the at here. I am speaking in case you cannot hear me. Um, so the this week is essay two. I finished grading all the uh, first essays, I believe. So uh, hopefully you've gotten some feedback for your second essay. Second essay is roughly speaking, like the first essay, you'll choose the, um, you know, one of the texts that you've read that you want to write about. And uh, I do have prompts up. You can feel free to use those prompts. You can modify them as you see fit. You can address a different topic if you feel that you want to do that. Um, you do need to go ahead and get essay two turned in this week because then you need to turn around and start working on essay three, which is going to involve some research on your part. So try to go ahead and finish up essay two like I said, this week at some point, um, and uh, then go ahead and start thinking about what you want to do a little bit more research on for your final topic. There are topics up for the research essay, too. They are, if you've already noticed, very broad, as in exceedingly broad. Uh, and the idea is that they should be broad. You, you need to narrow those topics down as you start doing your research. So um, we'll talk more about that maybe towards the end of um, our time together today and then make it a part of what we do in class next week. Uh, I don't want to get too bogged down in that since you should be working on uh, essay two at this point. Uh, Al Medina, I see that you are typing, so I'll let you ask your question. Keep going, go right ahead. Oh, did you? Hmm. Let me see what it was. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm, my apologies. You did. On May 27th, in fact. Um, I just must have overlooked that one. So, uh, annotated bibliography and research essay. Good questions. Um, some of that I, I've kind of explained there. But the annotated bibliography, uh, I didn't ex uh, explain at that point. That is a, um, a component of the uh, of the of the course of your grade, uh, and it is intended to be something that sparks you towards doing research for the research essay. So you should think of it as the first step in doing your research essay. You want to find a number of articles um, in um, in JSTOR, and towards the end of the class this evening, I'll, I'll show us around a little bit in the, in the online offerings that we have at the college. Uh, you want to find some articles there. You want to maybe find some articles or uh, a book, an ebook, and all you do for the annotated bibliography is you quickly summarize what the uh, argument is of that article or book, and you give a quick statement about how you think it's going to support your analysis of whatever the text is. So um, there's only three secondary sources that you need. 
So, and they can be articles, they can be books, whatever you see uh, helps you the most. Um, and, and then you submit that. That's really, that's really all there is. I'll have a lot more. Actually, there is some detail in the section about the annotated, bibli annotated bibliography. There's a link that takes you to the, um, to the Purdue website um, that gives you some in information about an annotated, annotated bibliography. Their detail is much more than what I am looking for. All I want is a quick summary of what the article is and a quick um, explanation of how you think that's going to help you. That's really all I want for, for us. Elizabeth, I, I actually just responded to your email. It is uh, a, a paragraph for each one of the 10 um, prompts that are on the midterm. Uh, and that paragraph length can be, um, I, I should, you should probably aim for a minimum of about 150 words. Uh, it can be as long as you really want it to be. You do want to make sure that you include, you know, um, uh, quotes from the text to kind of support what it is that you're saying. So yes, one paragraph for each one of those topics, excluding the extra credit. The extra credit is extra. You can do that if you wish. You are very welcome. Um, so I, I hope I, I get the sense that I've responded to a number of other emails. Uh, so I, and, and Al Medina, I sincerely apologize. I don't know why I overlooked that one, but that's um, you know, kind of a summary of what I'm looking for for the uh, annotated bibliography. Now, what I want to do is, um, and I see Roger, you're going to ask me a question, but I'm going to go ahead and keep talking. I'll I'll answer your question in just a second uh, when you when you finish it. Um, Tonight, what I want to do is I want to quickly delve into some concepts of medieval sexuality that popped up in some of the readings. I want to look at uh, the importance of Dante in um, kind of giving you a counterpoint to some of the ideas in my defaults. I want to look at the briefly the um, the sermon by Innocent the uh, Third again to give a counterpoint to some of the ideas that are offered up by my defaults and then delve into the stories for the first half. Now, I know that we have a quiz for my default, so I'd like to break us up into groups later and for you to have a chance to kind of go over those quiz questions with each other, and then we'll approach them together. Uh, if we have any time left this evening, I want to go ahead and start the process of transitioning into the Enlightenment. I do really think that all of that is going to take place in Top Hat in a video lecture in Top Hat. And I know I did promise a video lecture on the Middle Ages, but then I, I looked over the slides in the Middle Ages, and I, I think generally I got the more, the most important information for us to understand my defaults into the last week's meeting. And I know I know we didn't meet last week, but hopefully you had a chance to watch the video of the Tuesday class that I have, and um, where I did go over many of those points, and. Um, Oh, yes. Cruel Intentions is an update of Dangerous Liaisons. Yes. Yep, it is. Um, so if you've seen Cruel Intentions, then you will have you'll have seen kind of a modern form of um, Dangerous Liaisons. Dangerous Liaisons is a, an 18th century novel. The movie you're watching, of course, is not an 18th century movie because they didn't exist at the time, but it is based very closely. Uh, well, it, it's actually based on a play, which was very close to the content of the original uh, novel. And so it, it is really a very good apt ap adaptation of the novel. And, you know, it, interesting enough to watch, too, I think. Yes, John Malkovich. At his, one of, you know, his peak. I, I love that John Malkovich. That's when he was uh, at his best, I think. And Glenn Close, Yep. Now I have a, and I'll show you this in just a minute. Actually, why don't I just go ahead and show it? I have a, uh, a. I wonder if I can move around in that tab. Let's see. I have a link to a copy of the movie in case you uh, don't have the funds to rent one from Amazon. Amazon is is 
you can rent this movie from Amazon for something like two dollars, I think, and it's a really high quality stream. Um, otherwise, you can always use the link that you will find in the assignments section. If you scroll down, I'm not sure why I put it in the quizzes section, but that's where it is. If you scroll down to the quizzes section, you'll see a link right here, Dangerous Liaisons Film Viewing. Click that, and that will take you to this, and that should open, not, uh, that should open, yep, a copy of the movie. It's not a very high quality copy of the movie. So, you know, don't, um, I, I encourage you to see it a different way, if at all possible. But oh, good, the link worked good. Um, but if you don't want to pay for it, then there, there you go. Uh, you are all lucky that we have COVID nineteen because I, I created some workarounds. Normally, you would have had to go to the library on um, campus and watch it. Oh, no, actually, no, we would have watched it in class. What am I talking about? You know, so you're not lucky that we have COVID nineteen. We would have been able to see this in the theater, down in the bottom of Deerwood. Uh, really lovely screen, and I have a Blu-ray copy. It would have been really cool. Oh, well. Um, yeah, it, it should look a bit like a YouTube-like stream, Roger. So, um, Dangerous Liaisons is a reading, quote, unquote, Asquala. So it is um, going to be on the final exam, so you need to make sure that you take a chance to read it. It is not graded, and I mean, it is graded on the final exam, but um, there is no quiz associated with it. So there is no graded assignment associated with Dangerous Liaisons. We will do a bit of an analysis of it next week, and then we will transition fairly quickly into, I really only want to spend about half an hour on it, maybe a little bit more, and then we'll move into Thomas Mann's Death in Venice, which is a much more difficult text to get through. So, um, so you should take a chance to watch it at some point. Okay, while I'm over there sharing my screen, I want to go back to where I was at the beginning, which was uh, right here in the course introduction, little module, and the course overview, just to prove to you that I wasn't lying, that we are in week five, and that leaves week six, and then week seven. Now, you'll notice essay two is this week, research essay, the due date is next week. It's as flexible as any of the other due dates that we've had, um, but you you want to turn it in. I mean, we only have one week after that, and then you have to get to the final exam. So a lot of content is really um, pressed into these last couple of weeks. So let's go ahead and get started on my defaults. And in order to get started on my defaults, and I see Genesis, you're typing, so but go right ahead, keep uh, keep typing away. But um, while you are typing. I want to uh, upload. I need to stop sharing the screen. There we go. I want to upload. Uh, one of the articles that we uh, that I have up for this um, for this module. I don't know. There are a lot of articles there. Um, Many of them are pretty straightforward to read. Uh, oh, yeah, that's not going to work, is it, at all? Okay, so let me stop. Let me stop sharing that and share my screen instead. Since I've got it open over on the other side. There. Oh. Should work a little bit better. It looks like it's taking a second. Ah, there it is. Okay. So um, this is the article. Uh, it's called uh, Church Fathers and Independent Virgins. And, and I want to start with this um, first to give a, a, a quick idea of why this is important and um, why you should read it. One, it uh, doesn't seem to have that much to do with the Middle Ages at all. It's actually about um, the church fathers. So this goes all the way back to the very beginning of Christianity. The um, it is, however, very important for the Middle Ages because what this gives us is a different, more subtle concept of sexuality than you generally talk about because what this argument includes is that concepts of virginity and what 
the medieval people thought of as chastity are also important components of sexuality. So it's the concept of a denial of sex as a um, as an idea of sexuality. And Genesis says, I've, as I implied, I believe, um, the carnal and the flesh. Yes, very good. Um, the midterm, strictly tonight, you know, in quotation marks, it's flexible. The due dates are flexible. So this one is flexible as well. So uh, if you can't get it in tonight, that's not a problem. Um, but yes, this relationship between the carnal, the carnal is the flesh, right? The carnal is, it is actually comes from a word that means meat, uh, the flesh. That's what carnality is. It's all about the flesh versus, you're absolutely right, the spiritual. And um, so what we have, what this article does is it paints uh, the importance of chastity. There's the word chastity, and let's see if I can highlight it. And I can't, but hopefully you can see my little arrow pointing towards it so I don't have to spell it out. Chastity is not strictly identical to virginity, but um, as I implied in, in the last lecture, the lecture from last week that hopefully you saw the recording of, um, virginity is fascinating in the early Christian world because what the early Christians do is they open up the concept of virginity to men. And so that it is no longer strictly a physical barrier type concept that is broken and can never be returned to, but instead it modifies, it morphs and has a component in this concept of chastity. Virginity is still in the Middle Ages a physical concept, but it shares a lot of its spiritual quality with this concept of chastity. And I, I believe you probably saw that word mentioned a couple of times in my defaults. Like, I can't think of an actual passage where she mentions it, but it's probably in there somewhere. This idea of chastity was absolutely essential to medieval concepts of sexuality. I want to flip back over and make sure there's no conversation. Nope. So uh, you need to think about how um, how subtle and varied and more complicated uh, sexuality was in the Middle Ages than you may think it was. We get a contemporary view of sexuality in the Middle Ages as being something like a binary, strict, radical binary. It's either you're, you're a good married person or you're a bad person who sleeps with prostitutes, or you're a prostitute, I guess, a, a trinity or something. <laughs> that would be interesting. But that's not the way it was. It was a much, much more flexible concept of sexuality than we even have today because of the, the fluidity of masculinity in the medieval world. Uh, masculinity became very fluid and embraced a lot of the components of the effeminate or what the Romans would have thought of as being effeminate, um, especially in these concepts of chastity. Men were supposed to be chaste just like women were, and chastity was supposed to continue into marriage. That's how it's not like virginity. It, it's a spiritual renunciation concept. You renounce your physical body. Even in marriage, you are asked to do that. Uh, even in you know loving relationships. It doesn't mean, though, that they said, um, like Tertullian earlier, the beginning of Christianity, that sexuality and sex and marriage was was sinful. That's not a medieval concept. Instead, sex is perfectly allowed in marriage. Sex outside of marriage is sinful. Adultery is very sinful, um, etc. But the uh, this idea of chastity pervades uh, all aspects of the medieval Christian life, especially in the uh, 11th and 12th centuries on up into up until the Renaissance. The strength of the warrior culture before that was uh, was um, well, one, it was deeply rooted. So there is a warrior culture, there is an obsession with highly masculine, you know, concepts of power, etc. But even then you have a um, in many of the stories like Beowulf and, and elsewhere, you have the sense of duty and dedication that slips over into these deep feelings of love for one. Uh, 
patriots on the battlefield. Beowulf does not have, you know, if you don't know what Beowulf is, Beowulf is a ninth century, roughly, around about ninth century Anglo-Saxon poem in England. Um, and it is a poem that was written down by Christian monks. And in Beowulf, um, he doesn't actually have sex with anyone, to be honest, uh, even though he does end up with the king. I, I don't even think he has children, um, but he has deep brotherly feelings for those uh, his compatriots on the battlefield. There's this um, there's this very um, loving atmosphere when he speaks about his comrades. Uh, it's a deep, deep, deep friendship that may not touch into the physical, but is definitely a deeply, um, a deeply emotional bond between them. So what has happened is that, especially when Christianity becomes the norm, this concept of chatty brought in by Christianity becomes the staple for both genders. It also creates an avenue. Um, love requires of its servants chastity and thought and word and deed and one of the Lord. The lay of Grelon. <laughs> Excellent. That is excellent, Roger. Very good. I'm very proud of you. Um, wonderful. So yes, um, the um, the the concept of chastity moving into the Middle Ages too brings with it, and this is a very important idea, I think, a third gender. What is effectively a third gender, and that is man or woman who denies their sexuality. Those are the monks and the nuns, but also others who like to live as monks and nuns and are celebrated in all sorts of literature. Um, effect is a third, the ascetics. Yes, absolutely, Genesis. Man, you, you are all, all of you are very sharp this evening. Good. Um, they effectively act like a third gender. They are not male because they don't embrace those concepts of masculinity that we see in the Roman world. They're not female, the women who choose it, because they're not the property of anyone. And, and what um, what Church Fathers Independent Virgins points out is that this idea of women reclaiming their virginity um, and actually moving out of marriage uh, was something that the church actually had to put their foot down on. They feared it immensely. You're absolutely right. They feared, they, they both promoted virginity and chastity to all Christians, but at the same time were afraid of the extremities that go to in order to claim that, that passage towards divinity or what they saw as being a passage towards divinity. And you're absolutely right, Genesis. They did not want women breaking, and you're right to focus on women, by the way. They did not want women breaking those gender roles. And that is an internal conflict in early Christianity that goes well into the Middle Ages. This idea of living a chaste life, but being a mother, being a virgin, but then being a mother, um, being a chaste person, but being a good lover to the husband, so the husband doesn't go shopping for other lovers, etc. Um, and I think you're absolutely right, Genesis. Yes, that the men who chose the ascetic life, they, they held on to their patriarchal power. They were able to command anyone who wasn't, uh, wasn't a man. They were able to command children, etc. So they retain that power. Women seem to be trying to gain that power according to what you see in a lot of the writing from the early church and that 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 was what they saw as being problematic so there is a deeply um egalitarian component inside of early christianity that that has to get kind of hammered out as it moves towards the middle ages but what gets hammered out is the egalit the social egalitarianism the spiritual egalitarianism is retained um to a certain extent. Now, I, if you if you saw the lecture last time, you noticed that I said that women were supposed to be trained by their husbands to be, you know, good Christians. That 
is still an idea in the Middle Ages in the Catholic Church that the husband is the spiritual guide to the to the woman who is naturally weak. But there is a a kind of um, a, a type of radical egalitarianism in the idea of the spiritual um, perfectibility of both women and men in medieval thought. Yes, you're absolutely right, Genesis, because Adam was the one who taught Eve, and Adam didn't teach Eve well enough. Uh, and so there's this you know, kind of uh, command by uh, the medieval church, certainly, that, oh yes, absolutely. Uh, there's a command by the medieval church that not only are you the teacher, the husband is the teacher, the wife, but they have to be a good teacher. They have to dedicate themselves to it. Um, you don't see that, by the way, in any of these stories in the Lay of Maida Foss. Um, there is that one fascinating story where the man falls in love with the woman and, and actually his wife says, okay, you can have her, I'm going to go be a nun, um, which was an odd one from her, but I um, can't remember the name of that one. It is... Somebody can find it before me. You're good. Yes, you're right. It is Ella Duke. Yep. You did find it before me, Genesis. Very good. Um, Matthew 19. You're all scholars tonight. It's like I'm having a conversation with a whole bunch of scholars. Well, then. Um, good. Wonderful. So let's, um, I think you get kind of an idea of where I'm going with this. And that is that uh, it, there is this internal egalitarianism in Christianity that's moving into the Middle Ages. Uh, there's a theological possibility for this um, radical egalitarianism. Um, and uh, yet there are still the rules. There's still the things that you you have to do. You, um, you have to follow. You have to follow these rules. And it's that conflict between uh, rules and thought, I think, that um, many of these stories from my defaults actually fit into. But let's um, let's take a look at the... Uh, well, and actually, well, yeah, let me go ahead and t bring it up. I, I, you all seem to be so well read this evening that maybe there's no need for me to look at. How many of you uh, perused the fifth canto of Dante's Inferno? If you're all very familiar with it, then maybe there's no need for me trying to bring it up at all. So I, I, um, I looked at it and it was kind of interesting because my interpretation of like, that was a lot different. I think I've, I've, I've read like summaries of it. So I know about like the set, like he travels down to the different circles of hell, but in this one, it actually specifies that like he, when he came there, he talked to a bunch of lovers <laughs> that were like led astray by, um, how do I say they were led astray by like love stories they've read from other from other lovers, which was really strange. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, you should all at some point take a, take a look at the entirety of the Inferno, and actually the entirety of the Divine Comedy. It is wonderful. The Inferno is fascinating. It is a fun read. It's very gruesome and grim and brutal, and there's a lot of horror <laughs> in it. To be quite honest, really gruesome images of people being, you know, ripped apart and stuff. But what I've given you is the Canto Five, where you're absolutely right. These are the lovers, um, and what you see there is a is a um, is you're again you're right. Virgil, who is leading Dante through hell, um, allows Dante to and actually encourages Dante to call people over at each one of the major areas, well, the circles, uh, and to ask them things. And so he calls over these these uh, this woman and her lover, and he asks them, why are they there? And you're right that they're there because of literature. So what this opens up is a very important components of medieval thought. First, 
that literature can be dangerous. Not everyone was literate, and those who were literate were taught in their literacy to, to um, not seek out certain texts. And in other words, to they were taught how to read certain texts in order to not be endangered. Yes, Genesis, like Ovid, they were taught how to read Ovid, especially, by the way, the Metamorphoses. So the Metamorphoses, which I don't know if any of you have read, that was very, very popular in medieval thought, and it was read, generally speaking, as types of Christian allegories, good moral behavior versus bad moral behavior, and associated punishments and changes and, and concepts like that. They were read in order to give the, if you were a trained reader, you read them so that they gave you guidance on how to be a good Christian, even though it's not a Christian text. Um, the, the story that's mentioned in My Defaults is from the art of love. It probably is the art of love that's getting thrown into the fire in Gijmar. And that one was not, you know, a, a, a text that was promoted in any way by the church, but was still very, very, very popular, um, primarily because it was titillating. It, it's a, it's something that, it, it's a collection of poems that you can go read if you have a copy of the book. They're, they're in the book that you got. It's poems that are oriented around how to commit adultery. And um, and so, yes, she does hold him in contempt a bit, especially when it comes to the idea of being able to control things. But um, we'll get to that in just a moment. So, um, so these stories, if you were trained to read them, that's okay. If they, if and m many of them were okay, but all of them have a type of danger inside of them that if you don't hold your own, if you don't protect yourself against the um, the narratives, then you can be overwhelmed and commit sinful behavior. And that's what we see in these lovers in the uh, in that canto. So that's one component that you should think about is the danger of literature, that it, it can risk, you can risk your soul by reading the wrong things. The other component that's more subtle that you have to have a, a greater context for is the response by Dante himself. Um, Dante will go through the rest of the inferno, the rest of hell, seeing really, really horrible things, smelling really horrible things. At one point, the two of them have to sit down behind a sepulcher of all places and just take a moment so that they can adapt to the odors of, of burning flesh and awful and um, feces and everything else that's described in this poem. They have to, that's how horrible it smells. Um, and yet throughout the rest of this trip and all the other horrible things that he sees at no other point does Dante faint. This is the only point at which he faints. And what this could be is you're absolutely right that he has this deep sympathy for them, but he has very little sympathy for anyone else. In fact, uh, later he's going to find a friend of his. He, he sees a number of friends of his, uh, and he also sees a number of enemies. You know, he takes great joy in being able to put them down in hell and, and you know, torture them horribly. But he, he comes across a friend, a teacher of his, that he knew was a homosexual and he talks to him and he he feels for him and and he is sad that he's down there but you no know, he doesn't faint he's not that overwhelmed by it they have a you know conversation and he just feels kind of bad about the thing the whole thing this is the one moment where he feels so overwhelmed by that sympathy that he that he passes out. And maybe it's not even sympathy. Maybe it's empathy. In other words, maybe he has felt those same things that led these two lovers to eventually die. Now, there's a, a lot of other accidents. Yes, I think that's, that could be at Genesis. There's a lot of other accidents, too. They are only in hell because, well, maybe not only in hell, but they are, are in hell because their husband caught them in the middle of having sex with each other and killed the two of them. 
And so they were not able to ask for absolution, and they also committed adultery. So all of them, all three of them are actually in hell. The husband is much lower in hell than the two of them are. But uh, if they had called off the affair and gone back to, you know, um, to um, ask for forgiveness and uh, done their proper penance, then they may not at all have been down there. They didn't have the chance to. So there's a an accident that adds on to this sense of sympathy for the two of them. But I think too, there's this there's this um, indication of kind of a of a of a conflict inside of Dante at this point that he's probably going to give up on. But that conflict is that this does not seem to warrant the punishment that they are receiving, that they, you know, at, at this point, it seems as though they just kissed when they, they didn't do anything. It says that they put the book aside and, you know, they, they didn't read anymore. So maybe the implication is that they did have sex with each other. Um, but there's this sense that uh, if they had not been murdered, then they would have potentially been able to call the whole thing off and go back to asking for penance and, and, and getting out of this, this hell, this eternal damnation. So there's a sense of this lack of justice here, that this doesn't seem like a just outcome. And maybe that's one of the reasons that Dante faints. But he also recognizes that he is unable to determine what is a just outcome and what isn't. That that is up to divine concepts of justice, which are not in the Middle Ages equivalent to human concepts of justice. They're, they're, there's a radical difference between the two of them. So this brings me to what we see in My Defaults, and that is a lot of adultery. And we see some of these adulterous relationships not leading to bad outcomes, and some of the adulterous relationships definitely leading to bad outcomes. So it seems as though there is a counter narrative here about the concept of adultery. And maybe the counter narrative is actually about the legal framing of what determines what is adultery. And that is that it, it may seem as though, from Ida France's point of view, that the real problem is marriage, the legal sort of human framing of marriage as being the, the thing that needs to get renegotiated. But before we get to that, I also, well, I don't know if I, I really need to read you um, the sermon. The sermon uh, of uh, human misery, the sermon on human human misery by Innocent the Third, is something that also emerges from right around the same time as my defense's writing. Uh, Dante, by the way, is after my defense, and yes, uh, Innocent the Third was a is a real real bummer. Um, Dante is after my defense. Innocent the Third is a bit afterwards, but right around the, uh, th there's a bit of an overlap. Innocent the Third is someone who sparked a crusade. So, you know, that's also kind of something that makes him a bummer. <laughs> but, uh, and this type of lecture, this type of sermon would have been intended to remind people of their iniquity, their their eternal damnation that would was about to come, and that they therefore they need to go off to the Crusades in order to be saved uh, of from that eternal damnation. Maybe that's what he's after here. The medieval view of the afterlife, by the way, is three tiered. So you have hell which is eternal damnation. There's no getting out of hell. If you commit uh, mortal sins, then you go to hell unless you have received enough penance, or actually you've asked for forgiveness and you've done enough penance, then maybe you can get into the second level, which is purgatory. Purgatory is the middle section. You could think about it like that. Um, that is where most average everyday people would go as long as they went to church regularly, as long as they didn't commit any mortal sins. And if they did, that they did penance for the mortal sins and um, they, they, they did some minor things like lie to people or something. Uh, any, any, pretty much anything you did 
um, like you know, dreaming <laughs> of having a relationship with someone else's wife. That would get you into purgatory unless you win and you ask for penance and all that stuff. Um, lying to your neighbor, lying to your friends, just telling a little white lie to your children about you know what happened to their pet or something. That would get you into purgatory. Everything pretty much gets you into purgatory and live, unless you are a saint. And if you're a saint and you live a life like a saint, then you could ascend straight to heaven. Otherwise, in purgatory, you kind of work off your sins. And eventually, at the end times, um, depending on your theologist here, you'd, you'd go up into heaven and hang out. It's a bit rigged, yes. So, um, and the... So that's that's the second level, and heaven's only reserved for those up top. Now, the concepts of mortal sins, these are the mortal sins that you that would get you down there. Adultery, um, murder, rage, a gluttony, um, what else? Um, uh, different forms of sexual behavior, like greed, lust, yes, those get you down there. Uh, like I mentioned, a, a man who was a homosexual, um, now, that doesn't mean people who um, put their penises in uh, other men, <laughs> to try to frame that the best way. Uh, that doesn't mean that doing that, having sexual intercourse with another man, a man having sexual intercourse with another man was automatically a mortal sin. That doesn't seem to be the case, actually. What we're talking about is that the man that's described in Dante, at any rate, seems to have been a... Uh, a, a man who only had relationships with other men, exclusively what we would call homosexual. Um, and so that definitely ends up as a mortal sin. Following the wrong religion or teaching the wrong thing in churches can be mortal sins. One mortal sin you may have never heard of or thought about in the Middle Ages is something called usury. And I wonder if any of you know what usury is. I'll give you a second to think about it. Oh, yes, absolutely. Roger, you are correct. So, uh, hang on one second. There is a, another bag of rice right behind that one that's a basmati. Um, Okay, what are you cooking? Hang on, hang on, everybody. I, I need to figure out what's up for dinner here because I'm getting hungry already. Why won't there be enough food for me? Okay, all right, that's fine. It's bug off. Um, anyway, sorry, dinner discussions. So, um, predatory lending is exactly what it is. And um, the usurers in the Divine Comedy are down around the middle. The, the lower you go, the worse it is. They are below halfway. That's, um, they are below murderers, in fact. And the reason is that uh, in the medieval mind, loaning money and expecting that it would somehow reproduce and create more money was seen as being a perversion a perversion of nature. That That's just not the way it works. If you put two coins next to each other, they're not going to copulate and create a third one. We all wish that were the case, but it's it's not. And so they saw the idea of any, and you say predatory lending, it's actually any charging of interest they saw as being a mortal sin. Now, those religions that did not see this as a mortal, in, uh, as a mortal sin, at least one of them I can think of is Judaism. And so in the Middle Ages, if you needed to borrow cash, then you went to a Jew in the town. And that is, of course, one of the reasons that there's such a deep-seated anti-Semitism throughout Europe for a, a very, very long time. Um, I have been told, by the way, that charging interest is still a sin. It's just not a mortal sin. It's a it's what's called a venal sin, a low, a low lying sin. So I'm assuming that if you're Catholic and you have a bank account that charges interest, that you have to ask you, you have to ask for forgiveness for that. Or maybe it's just the idea of you do it personally. Maybe that's the problem. But at any rate, there's a different 
concept of what formulates mortal sin. The final thing to say about Dante's Inferno, and I know I'm chatting on a little bit about this, but the final idea is, again, this is a part that you haven't read, but at the very, very bottom of hell, the lowest point you can get to where the worst of all possible sins exists, are those who have betrayed someone. A betrayal of a trust is what is at the very, very bottom. The great trinity of those are, of course, Judas. But then, too, you may not think about, or you may not even know who these are. These are Brutus and Cassius. These are, Brutus is one who betrayed Caesar, stabbing him in the back and, you know, making him no longer a dictator, showing the importance of Caesar even for medieval thought because of the sense of, of the first king effectively being betrayed by his followers. So that gives you an idea of the, the risk, obviously, of, of, um, of betraying a king or committing a regicide. Those, those would have gotten you into the very bottom of hell. But also this notion of trust and the betrayal of that trust and how how horrible of a thing that was it is betraying a trust is worse than murder is worse than usury is worse than adultery and you would think okay so adultery is a type of betrayal of trust well it's a more it's more betrayal of trust if you break those rules that tie together brotherhoods, that tie together society, that tie together the, the, uh, the king and his people. That's the worst of all possible sins. So adultery doesn't do that, um, even though it is, you know, if bros ever checks, even though it is a, uh, a, a, a sin, a mortal sin, it's not considered at all to be a betrayal. So th think about that too. You say Genesis bros over chicks, but think about the fact that the wife having an adulterous affair was not was at the other end of the spectrum of sin from the man lying to his neighbor and you know or betraying a tr the trust of his neighbor or whatever it is that that should give you a sense of the emotional ties that exist between men, between friends, and between sort of colleagues and citizens, etc. And the lack of emotional ties that exist in marriages. And there's that too. I mean, yes, the woman committing adultery, the man could always simply... Um, simply remarry. And so there is, as you say, a very good point. There's no impact to the patriarchy to the extent that betraying the trust of a king or betraying the trust of a, of a military neighbor or et cetera, that that would be a, a profound, profound problem. But it also, I think, signals that and something that you need to keep in mind is the lack of, of the apparent, put it that way, the apparent lack of emotional connection between husband and wife. So that the husband, when he's betrayed, doesn't think about it, it seemingly, from Dante's point of view, doesn't think about it as an emotional betrayal. He thinks about it simply as this, you're not supposed to be doing that. And, and of course, he can get angry and murder them, which is what that one husband does, but that it, it's, it, it isn't seen as being a type of betrayal necessarily. Uh, many of these marriages are arranged marriages. You certainly see that in most all the marriages that you have in the lay of mighty false. Nobility would not have fallen in love with each other and then gotten married the, um, in the 12th century in, in Europe, in France at any rate. It would have been um, marriage of convenience, marriage of family ties is really what it was. You, you would bind your family and your lineage to that of another important family or lineage. That's really the way they saw it. That does not mean that the love was not a component of these relationships. That's not the case, but that it wasn't the fundamental reason for the relationships. Um, 
I, I have arranged marriages are still very popular in parts of the world. And I've spoken to a number of people. It's just anecdote. But I've spoken to a number of people, a couple of people, not a number uh, of people who have been in arranged marriages, still in arranged marriages. And, um, you know, not wanting to get too sensitive about the whole thing or or to to be offensive, but trying to explore how how it you know kind of worked. And in most of those discussions, it was. They didn't know each other. Um, they, you know, they didn't dislike each other, but they didn't really, they didn't really know each other. And so it was really the the first a long part of the of the marriage was actually getting to know each other um, on just a, a, a fundamental basis, and and then it just became, you know, a marriage like any other, I guess. Which most marriages are getting to know each other for all of your lives, I guess. Anyway. Uh, the yes, yeah, there is a there's a a love that comes after, but it's not necessarily what it's not necessarily the type of love that gets promoted by Hollywood narratives and and contemporary love stories, et cetera. This overwhelming feeling of adulation or um or you know, a, a sense of of um connect deep connection or whatever it is that we want to call it nowadays. That's not really the concept in medieval literature until you get to these courtly love narratives. Um, the lay of the oak tree, yes. Uh, until you get to these courtly love narratives, it's exactly where I was going. These narratives, which are the beginning of a tradition called courtly love, are the stories that start to pop up and become really very popular in medieval Europe, especially in France and Italy. These are stories of love affairs. They're stories of the, the lover's uh, coming together uh, in, you know, across marriages, right? So quite a lot of adultery happens. Uh, there often or will be, after my default, stories about lovers uh, that cannot connect. So they feel deep love for each other, but they're not able to copulate. They're not able to, you know, um, no worries, Roger, that's perfectly fine. Um, not able to kind of bring things, uh, get, get into a relationship with each other. Um, Paris, Helen of Troy. Um, well, you know, actually it works kind of in the, that is, that is a paragon of a, of an interesting love affair. And it gets told in two ways in the middle ages. It really is a, a story of overwhelming, you know, they see each other and they have the hots for each other and they kind of run away with each other. Uh, in the Greek tale, it really is. She gets effectively, um, perverted by, Aphrodite into seeing him as a love object, and then that's why they they get to it. Yep. So let's take a let's take a gander at some of the stories and start probing into some themes here. Um, I'm happy to see that there's you've generally had no problems apparently in in doing the reading. I think that these are really straightforward straightforward stories. They don't you know they don't tax you in the way that Ovid did, and I understand that many of you are still struggling with Ovid, and I sympathize. Um, it's, uh, it, it's rite of passage, put it that way. Um, so these stories hopefully felt a lot easier to read. They just kind of, you flowed through them. But one of the problems is that they, they may feel kind of superficial and it may be difficult to really pull out any, anything to be critical of, anything to really explore deeper. So let's, let's try to do that a little bit. One of the, um, uh, one of the aspects here, one of the, the concepts uh, that pops up is in, in Gijmar. Let me contextualize. I'm talking about Gijmar here. Uh, in Gijmar, uh, what we have is someone who in Gijmar seems to be somehow broken. There seems to be something not quite right about him because he has a, um, he doesn't have love for anyone. He doesn't love anyone. And she says that it's unnatural. Now, I say there's a reference to St. Jerome that I need to call forward on page 19. Give me one second here. And this is uh, St. Jerome that would have been quoted in the uh, Church Fathers and Independent Virgins. Yeah. So St. Jerome wrote quite a bit about being chaste and what... Um, oh, shoot. What's her name? Um, the writer of this particular book says on page 18 and 19 of 
Church Fathers and Independent Virgins, that the handout. For the fathers, the church fathers, one of the important things to remember about sexuality was that it was natural for fallen humanity to feel lust. Quote, desire that is implanted in men by God to lead them to procreate children is internal, unquote, wrote St. Jerome, adding that it was very difficult to, quote, overcome that which is innate in you, unquote. For someone to live a chaste and spiritual life, he or she must, quote, act against nature, unquote. So Jerome gives us the sense that that there is a an internal drive to feel, as Maida Foss would say, love. That's the fact she's talking about desire here, really. And yet he does not. So he it puts him almost in this saintly position that you would think she would say makes him like a saint. He doesn't want to go around having sex with a whole bunch of people. But instead, what she says is that it nature had done him such a grievous wrong that he never displayed the slightest interest in love. There was no lady or maiden on earth, however noble or beautiful, who would not have been happy to accept him as her lover if he had sought her love. Women frequently made advances to him, but he was indifferent to them. He showed no visible interest in love and was thus considered a lost cause by stranger and friend alike. This is a fascinating description, especially given the context of exactly what St. Jerome is talking about as being this natural innate impulse and that anyone who wants to act chaste has to go against nature. You're absolutely right. Genesis. She definitely does not view love as wrong. So we could see this as a already a bit of a conflict with St. Jerome, potentially. We could see this as really her stating exactly what St. Jerome said, that St. Jerome said that desire was innate. And yet, and so when she says nature had done him a grievous wrong, she's saying, look, St. Jerome says that desire is innate. And yet he doesn't have any desire. So he's flawed. He's broken. There's something wrong with him. Uh, even, she would say, from St. Jerome's point of view. Now, this may in some ways resonate with the image that we get of the man who is guarding, the priest who is guarding the lady. Uh, she has no name, by the way. She's just the lady. And on the very next page, on page 46, it says that uh, this lady lives in the tower, etc. This is where the description of Ovid being thrown into the fire is. It says, an old priest with hoary white hair guarded the key to the gate. He had lost his lower members. Otherwise, he would not have been trusted. He recited the divine service and served her at table. When it says that he lost his mo lower members, otherwise he would not have been trusted, you know that that means, of course, that what those lower members, quote unquote, are his genitalia. You're right, Roger. He is a eunuch. And just to clarify the spelling on that, Roger, it's E-U-N-U-E-C-H. I'm sorry. E-U-N-U-C-H. Eunuch. There we go. So you're absolutely right. He is a eunuch and a priest, and that is a problem because according to church doctrine, eunuchs were not allowed to be priests. They were forbidden from being priests according to early church, uh, an early church rule, and I'm not sure if it's still, still the case, but in the early church, apparently according to one of the narratives, um, a whole bunch of very ascetic monks were castrating themselves. And in order, from their point of view, to, to eliminate the desires that were driving them towards the flesh. And there was a strong movement against that in the church. And the argument was that if you don't feel the desires, you cannot resist the desires, and that the resistance of the desires is what determines your saintliness, your lack of sinfulness, that this struggle against one's innate nature is exactly the component of Christianity that is um, you know, driving 
uh, the worship ceremonies, driving everything, that you have to resist these temptations because they are part of your own innate being. And it leads to different theological things. Um, you're, ab you're absolutely right, Roger. You can't resist it if there isn't one. And it's, um, it's not just the idea of moving, removing yourself from temptation because, you know, there, there's a long history of ascetics go off into the desert and they live there by themselves. Uh, and so you could say, well, they're removing themselves from temptation. That is roughly okay, it, it, the, even though that story and those ideas are tossed about back and forth in early Christian thought quite a bit as being, you know, maybe not the best way. It is a mutilation of the body, and that's where we get into this notion that the mutilated, and this is a very deeply medieval concept too, the mutilated are not going to get into heaven. That anyone who has um, lost limbs, according to some traditions, lost their head, or lost you know, other parts, are not going to be able to get into heaven. Um, one of the reasons for capitation, decapitation in medieval punishments was to, you know, uh, bury their head somewhere off so they wouldn't be able to find it again and wouldn't rise up into the heavens or something like that. There are many different stories about this, and who knows how many of them are true. But at any rate, so we have a priest who is not really a priest, a priest who can't really be a priest, a priest who is unnatural. And we have Kishmar, who at the beginning is unnatural. And so maybe there's a thematic connection between the two that my defense wants to pull forward. Um, could just be a convenience thing too, right? I mean, this is the only man that would be trusted. But but there is, I mean, she turns him into a priest. Oh, yes, Roger, the French Revolution with all the decapitations. Yep, that was the punishment. People are not getting into heaven. Not to say that they wouldn't necessarily have gotten into heaven anyway, but uh, certainly not with their guillotined heads. So um, now there's a lot of contradictions here, right? Because uh, many, many, many saints have been mutilated. Uh, there's one saint whose name escapes me, but who was skinned alive. So all of his skin was peeled off of him. And he's shown in many depictions as a, as a body without skin. So you see the muscles and everything showing, and he's holding his skin in his hand. Yeah, so he's a saint, so he gets into heaven. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that this is a universal doctrine. There's a lot of inconsistencies here, but, um, but it is a, a the idea of the resistance of temptation and, and being a eunuch. That specific type of mutilation has a long history in the church, and there's a long history of argument against it and of excommunication of those who are castrated. Um, and I think, Genesis, you're on to a really important com idea here that he is unnatural and this imprisonment of the lady is, is unnatural. It's, it's as much of a perversion as he is. So we get to the idea of adultery. Um, so this is one of the stories that has adultery in it. And this is a story where the adultery is not punished. Um, and not only is it not punished, but this entire affair seems somehow to be driven by divinity. Uh, when Gijmar goes out and shoots that deer, the medieval reader understands that animals, especially talking animals, are meant to be read as allegory. You're supposed to, as the reader, try to understand what is the Christian meaning behind this? What is the allegorical meaning behind this? What, what else is underneath it? And there are plenty of bestiaries, these books that are, are just both descriptions of the natural uh, world of the animal, and oftentimes quite hilariously wrong, uh, but also descriptions of the allegorical meaning of the animals. Deer and hinds and uh, stags are inevitably, they inevitably stand for a specific concept of Christ, and that is the sacrificial notion of Christ. And so the deer here, anyone reading in the Middle Ages would have seen an allegory for Jesus. Not to say that they would have thought, oh my gosh, you know, Gijmar just shot Jesus. You know, he's going to hell. It's not that. 
Instead, they would have seen that the message is a divine message, that the deer is, a, is connecting somehow with, uh, with a divine narrative. And here we have this divine narrative that effectively sets up an adulterous affair, which doesn't seem to be possible. That, that would be contradictory. So, but it certainly seems that way from the reader's point of view, that there's something in, div in the divine world that is pushing these two together. Not only does the deer do this, but there's the ship that delivers him to, uh, to her shores. And that ship has, you know, there's, it, it's described as being in the center of the ship, he discovered a bed whose posts and side posts were wrought after the fashion of Solomon, engraved with inlaid gold and made of cypress wood and white ivory. So Solomon is a, a, a character in, uh, or historical figure in the old, what the Christians call the Old Testament. This is a biblical figure. So there's a suggestion that this is a divine uh, ship that a lot of the magic, quote unquote, that is happening here is actually divinity. Yep, he built the temple. That is actually the divinity, the divinity, it's divinity itself, pushing these two together. And then the ship shows up for her later to take her to him. So everything we have here suggests that divinity itself is pushing these two towards committing adultery and then saving them when they commit adultery, helping them. Well, that you would say, would be highly controversial. Um, and I think probably it would have been highly controversial if she had written this in Latin. Since she is writing this in Old French, and actually you can, can read part of it in Old French in the back if you want to. Um, if you have the copy of the book that I recommended, at the back of it there are a number of the poems in Old French. Here's... Um, well, let's see what they have. They have L'Enval, and then they have L'Austique, and then Chevrefeuille in Old French. Not to say that you could read Old French. I, I can't even read Old French. But um, So Genesis is getting right to a point that I'll bring up. Yes, that this concept of the institution of marriage and its perverse, its perversion maybe that is one of the components here. We see that in another of the stories when Yonek uh, um, is, well, the mother of Yonek is imprisoned in much the same way that the lady is imprisoned here. So um, that does not, however, get us past the idea, past the reality that these two are committing adultery. And we have two other characters who commit adultery, and they don't get away with the act. Um, and so, the, so we do get to this notion, as Genesis is pointing out, this idea of the justif justification for these two events. Um, adultery is a, however... To, to give some context here, adultery is a black or white issue. It, it is either you commit it or you don't. There is no justification for it. It is if you're married, you have sex with someone other than your husband or your wife, you've committed adultery. That's, that's it. That's the end of the conversation in medieval thought. So one of the things is that these stories seem to be suggesting that medieval thought is wrong, that they're there, there has to be some sort of not advocating for di di divorce. That does, that's not what Marie France seems to be doing, but that maybe that there are problematic marriages, marriages where um, there is no annulment. Right that, uh, now, to give you some context here, there's only one possible way of dissolving a marriage in Catholicism, and that is an annulment. And an annulment is an, can only happen if the husband and the wife have not consummated the marriage, meaning that they have not had sex with each other. So both husband and wife could argue, if they wanted an annulment, that they hadn't had sex with each other, unless, of course, they had had children, which then, you know, that would have been impossible uh, for you not to have sex and to have children. So... Um, Mr. Joseph, I guess. But 
uh, outside of that one incident, it uh, it would have been impossible. The lady here does not have children. The um, Yonek, or the mother of Yonek, does end up getting pregnant with the, the you know the child, assuming seemingly, at any rate, the child of the um, her adulterous lover. So, um, so neither one of these, at least at some some stage, any one of these women would have been able to say, "Let's have an annulment." But at Genesis is already getting where I'm going here. They they wouldn't have been able to. The husband is the one who has to apply for an annulment in medieval Catholicism. A, a wife would not had have had zero standing whatsoever. The husband would have been able to ask for it, and really, the only reason the husband would have been able to ask for it in most situations. I mean, we get a lot of records of this at any rate, that the husbands ask for an annulment if they don't have children under the argument that the uh, the wife is barren. And so even if they have had sex, that the wife can't produce children, and so therefore they should be able to marry someone else, and they can get an annulment in that way. But um, there you go. So there does seem to be an endorsement of these relationships. So how could it be possible there's a there's a logical impossibility here that that these two, if they're committing adultery, then divinity cannot be promoting it. That's just a contradiction. So the only other possibility is the argument that they are not committing adultery. Yes, Roger, you're absolutely right. So and I'm glad you bring that up. That is the clear statement that. Yonek's father, the Hawkman guy, is delivered by divinity. I mean, she prays, please, uh, God, help me get out of this, help me deal with this, or whatever she says, and voila, there arrived the Hawkman. He is literally delivered by God to help her in that horrible marriage. So, like I'm suggesting, I think that my defense is suggesting that the marriages are not real, that it does not matter if the two marriages, uh, the marriage with Yonek's mother and the marriage with Gijmar's lover and her husband, that um, after seven years, I have to read Yonek again more closely. Uh, but at any rate, that these two marriages are effectively not good, not real marriages. And uh, so, what we do, what we have to do is we have to figure out, okay, so why are they not real marriages? I mean, if they happen in the church, that means they're real. Uh, so this could be an argument against that concept that just because it happens in the church, it is de facto a real marriage. And in fact, it could be arguing for a fact that for the idea that the two husband and wife have to agree to partnerships. They have to agree and um, and and live up to the certain standards of being. Oh yeah, no. I, yes, you're absolutely right, Genesis. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah. They they did have. They did have um, the long term relationships, but that way, without having children, but um, but at any rate, the um, I was going to say the uh, the idea of the marriages. The the idea of the marriages have to. So what she could be suggesting is that marriage has to have certain components to make it real, components that are more than just a consummation of the marriage. Ideas like trust. I, I think that that seems to be one of the core features that holds these two, Yonek and, and uh, Gishmar together, and that distinguishes um, Bisclavre and um, Equitan, Equitan, that, that sets them apart. Those are not those. The things that happen in there are not the same. Um, the husbands in Yonek and Gijmar do not trust their wives. That's one of the early statements for both of them: is that they both feel as though they're going to be cuckolded, meaning that they're going to their wives are going to have an affair, and so they don't trust their wives, and therefore the marriage doesn't seem to be a real marriage from her point of view. Exactly, because they are old men. 
So in in Bisclavre uh, and Equitant, it, it changes. So in both of those relationships, the husbands trust their wives. Um, now, Equitant, we can see why she's punished because she tries to commit murder. Um, but I, but I, I think that there's a lot more to that story we need to look into in just a second. In Bisclavre, we know why she's punished because she also, well, she betrayed her husband and she betrayed that trust. You're absolutely right. He, she, it, he should never have trusted her with the, the, the truth about himself. But that leads us into another complication, and that is, isn't trust telling the truth about yourself? And so he was already not, uh, he was not being truthful in the relationship. Um, and I think that, well, let's go ahead and talk about the problems with the sim simple explanations or the simple understanding of that story. That um, he was already, and this is kind of not part, not much of a part of the story, but he he doesn't own up to the fact that he's a wolf man, a, a werewolf, from the very beginning of their relationship, from their marriage. So she does not know that she is married to someone who could kill her without him even knowing that he had done it. I mean, if we think about how werewolves theoretically work. So, um, so that's a that's a bit of information I think she probably should have had, you know, at the early part of the relationship, rather than you know him just saying, "Oh yeah, I, I guess I got to tell you this." So, I think, and I don't know if my defense does this intentionally, but she uh, she puts us into this position of having to, of coming into a bit of a conflict with our simple understanding of everything. And Roger, you bring up she should have left him. That's not really much of an option for her. I guess she could have told someone that he is a werewolf and he would have been killed, most likely. Um, and instead, you know, she she does what she does. Uh, but so she puts us into this kind of, you know, curious situation here where I guess we're trying to balance our morals. It would be difficult to really strongly argue for the husband here. But her response is what is really sneaky and is really wrong. I think my defense would say. So in other words, if the response had been, hey, I'm going to go find your clothes and I'm going to hide them so that you're not going to come kill me or something because you're an animal. I don't know what happens. Then maybe we would have been in a different situation of being able to judge her. But instead, what she does is she calls up, you know, the the guy who wanted to be her main squeeze and says, hey, babe, yeah, I guess if you want me, we can, we can try it out. Um, so she sets up this affair with someone that she has no feelings for. I think that's also a very important component here. She definitely does not feel anything for this lover that she invites to, to be in her bed. Instead, she wants him in order to plan this, you know, stealing thing. She exactly just, she has weaponized the concept of love. She's weaponized her own body effectively. Um, and that is definitely something that my defense does not agree with. We see that already in Gishmar. When the Ovid's work is being thrown into the fire, what is being banished is anyone who thinks that they can control love. That's what is getting thrown into the fire. Seeming to suggest that my defense and, and you you know, if you ever read any courtly love literature, this is a main concept in that literature. Love is uncontrollable. There is no way to control love. It is a type of divine magical force. And in courtly love literature, it's seen as being a type of divine force, which puts it into conflict with, you know, concepts of love and Christianity. Yes, it's divine there, but it's not desirous. It's it's just you know divine, um, linking desire to divinity. That's where courtly love poetry gets a little um, controversial, quite a lot controversial. So when we get to both Equiton and Bisclavre, what we have are these two women who we could we could feel sympathy for them. I, I certainly feel a lot of sympathy for Equiton as well because of the fact that the king has told her, if you don't have sex with me, I'm going to kill myself. What is she supposed to do? Uh, kings, uh, when they die, leave 
total wreckage behind them, especially if they don't have any children. Everything falls apart. Everybody starts killing each other. It's total chaos. So she's put in the position of either I have an affair with the king or we end up in total chaos. So that's a bad position to be in. But yet again, she turns this into a, a rational debate. She turns this into a, a, a reason. It's not to the extent of necessarily weaponizing her body, though she does do that, I guess, in, in saying that, look, if, if we do this, we're going to have to kill my husband. Um, but certainly she thinks through it. She doesn't feel it. And I think that's where my defaults uh, doesn't approve of this. Turns it into an opportunity, exactly. So what we have are these different um, components, uh, uh, different ways of approaching the idea of marriage in the Middle Ages. And I think that that's what my defense is after, is a more subtle understanding of what marriage is, rather than just a black or white, the church says it is so, therefore it is. And, um, and also a, a, an understanding of marriage that reinserts this concept of love into it so that it is a uh, it's a major component so you have a quiz uh, to do and what i was thinking is we take some time this evening to split you up into into little groups to work on the quiz i want to see if you're interested in doing that first if you really you know nobody's got an interest in doing it then i, I don't want to force you uh, to go over there and and work on it together but I think that sometimes it can be meaningful and you can under, end up understanding the quiz a little bit better if you're working on it with someone else. Um, what this would be would be 30 minutes of you get into two groups, uh, looking at the quiz, looking over potential answers, finding certainly passages in the book, uh, quotes in the book that support what it is that you want to say about it. And then you, after 30 minutes, you'd, uh, be switched back over into the main classroom and we can go over it together. And then um, actually we're already close to seven. So then that would be pretty much the end of the class. Maybe, maybe instead of doing that, what I should do, so let me just bring up the quiz and we'll work through it. We'll work through it together here. And I think that'll be easiest. Let me upload a presentation. Pull this into it. Hopefully this works. Uh, normally, I like to take a bit of a break here, and I, I think this is a pretty good, you know, opportunity for us to take a break before I start. Oh, why, why, why? Why is it so small? And when I expand it, it turns into that. That is silly. Oh, do this. That doesn't help. Well, hopefully you have a copy of the quiz. And so you don't have to look at my squished down little tiny copy of the quiz here. Uh, so we can go through it. But before we get to that, I, I really do. I really should go grab uh, a drink of water and stretch my legs a little bit. And then we'll we'll go over the quiz pretty quickly. Probably won't have that much time to, to start this transition that I wanted to do to the to go into the enlightenment. But um We'll do that. So let's come back at it's at 654 now. Let's come back right at seven uh, and then we'll spend some time on this. So uh, and feel free to if you have questions or anything or you want me to to highlight something in our discussion, type it into the chat. So I'll see it when I come back. Otherwise, go grab something to drink. I'll see you in just a minute.
Okay, neighbors. Let's let's run through it. So, and I need to open up a copy on my own so I can actually see what I'm reading. Uh, fairy tale aspect. Question number one: There, much of what we just spoke about. You know, I, I think that that um, certainly helps answer answer that question. Uh, this idea of this relationship between the fairy tale uh, magic that happens and this idea of this concept of divinity actually pushing the two together. Number two, um, the mal marié. That's effectively exactly what we were all just talking about. So no need to address that, I don't think. Um, sanctioned by God. That's exactly what Roger brought up already. There's a, there is a... This moment where he uh, changes himself into the shape of the woman and receives um, communion. It, in uh, medieval thought, it would have been completely impossible for any sort of demon or devil or anything like that to receive communion. They would have exploded, burned up, or something. So, Gishmar and Yonek. Question number four, uh, Marie sees the take, seems to take the side of the women. So that's where we were just going with that one too. So I think uh, I think we've effectively answered number four. Animal Im imagery of Bisclavre, I think that's a wonderful question, uh, really. And that is this notion of the, um, the animal being more human than the human, that the wolf is more noble than the woman, his wife, who betrays her, betrays him. That betrayal is a, type, is, a, is a characteristic that is lower than the animals. And in fact, animals are oftentimes seen as behaving in courtly ways because they are loyal to each other or they, when they live in a pact, they support each other and they defend each other, et cetera. Now, as far as the notion of Innocent III's depiction of humanity, I think this is a direct contrast, or not, a, a, not really a direct contrast. This actually seems to kind of always support what he's saying, and that all human beings are trash, effectively. For those of you who haven't read Innocent III, I mean, he's got a real low opinion of human beings, and um, that this sense that every human, every single human being is innately sinful and is innately damned from birth. Whereas, you know, this, many of the stories here, it's not just this one, but many of the stories offer a contradictory narrative to that, that uh, suggests that there's a more subtle uh, understanding of humanity and its, its uh, horribleness, that those who behave in a chaste way, that those who behave in a noble way, are themselves not those human beings that Innocent the Third is speaking about. The nobility and the behavior of nobility elevates one above your standard average, everyday, lowly human, I guess. And then we have a question about the handout of sex and sexuality. And so that's where we can kind of transition into. Now, if you have any questions about any of these, please feel free to type them into the chat or unmute yourselves. That's where we get into that handout sections of sex uh, before sexuality, which deals with medieval forms of love and sex. And in fact, primarily medieval concepts of love. Hopefully you saw that handout. We're able to download it and read it. And so uh, I just want to point you towards the section on the different types of love. So uh, they are referenced on page 43 of the handout. So the beginning of that major paragraph says, one theme strongly emerging from these studies is of the more fluid nature of attraction and arousal. Clear differentiation of sexes does not necessarily an erotic ideal, was not, I'm sorry, was not necessarily an erotic ideal, and male beauty was often celebrated in terms that may appear feminizing to modern eyes. This is such an important <laughs> statement here I, I, that I think I've kind of worked towards, but it's really essential to understanding 
you know, why this text is dealt with in this class. And that is that in the medieval understanding of the sexes, there wasn't a clear distinction between masculinity and femininity. Not like you see in the Roman world where there was this wall between the two. And the man who behaved in any way close to the wall uh, uh, that divided masculinity from femininity was an aberration and was berated, etc. That's not at all the case in medieval Europe. That there, the, as this scholar here talks about, there's this fluidity, and the closer to the middle the two of them get, the closer the two man woman get towards a type of androgyny, a, a type of a lack of gender, or what we may call a third gender, the better and the more divine they are. And inside of that are concepts of nobility and chastity. Anyway, sorry to harp on that again. Uh, let me. Go back over and see if anybody's example of this love. Uh, would pre-modern love, would pre-modern love sickness be seen as a type of love? This is a good question, Genesis. Um, give me a more understanding of what you mean by love sickness. You mean being sort of overwhelmed by um, an attraction or overwhelmed uh, feeling, yeah. infatuated. So yeah, so on in her in her text in that text, sex before sexuality, they talk about when people are so overwhelmed by um, love, the pre the pre modern love that they actually swoon or or fall ill or become or like physically die, like in um in Jesus I'm, uh, Eldrick, yeah Eldrick when yep. that when she became so overwhelmed or overcome with grief for the lie that Eldrick told her that she pretty much died. Yeah. So I want to know if that would be one of the types of love for like number six. That's what. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Perfect cool. answer. Absolutely a perfect answer. Yes. And um, I, I think that that is um, that's definitely one um, one of the avenues. And I'm glad you brought that one up. That's not one that I've ever really thought about including here. Uh, and there, there's many different as aspects of this, but the words uh, that I was looking for, the types of love that we can look at outside of that one concept of the pre-modern love and fainting and swooning and how kind of usual that was in, in medieval literature for both men and women, um, there is not much that can make sexual sort of blah, blah. Uh, there's not on page 43, it says, there is not much that can make a sexual historian blush, but love just might do it. Sexual historians may no longer be termed perverts, but love historians run the risk of being dismissed as unnecessarily euphemistic. Wonderful statement about how scholarly literature does tend towards the anti-love, but to move on. Yet love is a as complex and worthy of our serious attention as any other aspects of Eros. This may be a particularly true of medieval culture, which possessed a rich and diverse vocabulary on the theme. The chief Latin word for love include Latin words for love included caritas, which means selfless love, delectio, or admiration and high esteem, amicitia, I'm not sure if the stress is right there, amicitia, I think that's correct, friendship, affectio, meaning affection, cupiditas, meaning desire, often but not always sexual, and most importantly, amor, romantic love or passion encompassing eritas and cupiditas. So those are the terms there. And then she goes on to explain how muddled they generally were. I mean, they, they weren't consistently used in medieval literature. The, the writers themselves didn't use them consistently. Then she goes into some German terms, Mina and Liebe, and, and the distinction between the two of them. But what, what I really want you to think about is exactly what Genesis has kind of mentioned. These examples of types of love that are, are mentioned that we could categorize, in my defense, that you could category, uh, categorize according to these particular categories like cupidita amor affectio. And you also should remember that caritas and cupiditas are 
different things. So selfless love does not necessarily mean cupiditas, which is a desire, quite often a sexual desire, but that amor, romantic love, generally was seen as encompassing both of those things, or selfless love and sexual desire. So when the word amor is used uh, in medieval literature, it generally means those two things. Um, so really what this is, this question is designed to do is to do exactly, you know, kind of what Genesis has pointed out. You explore the story and you see how these, these terms, how these ideas of love and, and the subtle shading of all of them fits to some of the characters and their actions. Absolutely, Roger, perfect example of cupiditas. The knight who comes in just because he wants to have sex with the lady and then goes and steals the guy's clothes. Um, that, that's a perfect example of that. Yep. So if you have other examples you want to bring forward now, feel free. And if you have other questions about my default, I, I mean, I feel, I feel bad kind of uh, compressing it to, to what it is. Um, and I hope that I've hit on all the major components that I wanted to hit on, and I believe I have. Um, then please feel free to bring them up. Excellent example, Caritas. Guijmar and the, and the lady, Bisclavre, friendship with the, the king, accepts his friend. Oh, yes. Excellent examples, Roger. Very, very good examples. Exactly what I was after. And I, and the last thing that you have there, Roger, in that in that statement, the idea of the lovers referring to each other as friends is also essential. And I think I, I I'm not sure really if that is necessarily a universal component of marriage for or a good marriage for my default, but you can see that there seems to be kind of a friendliness between the husband and um, Equiton and the wife. Certainly he's very trusting of her, but there seems to be kind of a friendliness that's also in their marriage. And you could possibly see that in Bisclavre as well. Um, so it may be very well the case that uh, Maïd de France sees that as being an essential component to a good functioning marriage. Okay. Well, if you have anything else that pops up about my defaults and the stories and answers to these questions, um, you can feel free to bring them up here in the next uh, 45 minutes that we have with each other, or you can feel free to send them to me in, um, in a message as well. I want to do a couple of things here. I, th I think that we started to uh, talk about the research essay, and I said I'd, I'd try to get to it today, and I think this is probably a good time for me to go ahead and, and field some questions on that and also show you what it is that I'm talking about. doesn't mean that I'm completely putting um, my defense to bed here or saying we can't discuss it. This is one of my favorite works here in the class. I mean, all of them are sort of my favorites. I Ovid is a bit of a pain to read. I get that. But yeah, you know, there's something to get to get out of him at any rate. Um, this one's rich, it's wonderful, and the, and the Middle Ages is a uh, particular passion of mine, and it's difficult for me to shorten it the way I have to. But so so if you have more questions or more discussion about that, please do go ahead and put it in the chat. But I want to go ahead and share my screen and move over to the um, to our classroom and show you what it is that I'm talking about when I'm talking about uh, those assignments. 
So if you click over here in the assignments section, make sure you can see what I'm doing. It seems as though you can. Scroll down. Uh, this is the one you should be working on, uh, due the 3rd. And now that's the same date as the uh, quiz for my defaults as well. Um, flexible. This is the next one you want to get to. And you see the date is June the 8th. So you want to go ahead and take this week, if you can, to do some research. Here's the description. And I, I described it already a bit. Um, you get a little bit of information here. The requirements are really, well, let's say the minimal requirements are uh, three secondary sources. Now, if you don't know the difference between primary and secondary, it's easy to explain. A primary source for My Defaults is the book, My Defaults. That's a primary source. So you're not going to use that as one of your secondary sources if you want to do research on My Defaults. Instead, secondary sources, some examples of them, would be Sex Before Reality by um, Church Fathers and uh, Independent Virgins by Joyce Salisbury. Those are secondary works that you can use in your analysis of my defaults. So that's, that's the clarity about what those two terms mean. See if you have questions. Um, the secondary sources can be found by going to JSTOR. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, I'm going to show you. They do need to be scholarly resources, Roger, and I'll show you how we can get to some from the safety of our own homes. I'm going to need to share a different tab to do this. Um, Okay, so in this tab, if you go to our uh, the college's website here, the college's uh, login page of Majig, thing Majig, whatever it's called, yours is going to be a little bit different than what you see here. So I'm uh, as a faculty member, I have different things in front of me. But on the right hand side, hopefully, you should still have these things called useful links, and in there, at least you'll be able to click this link that says Library and Learning Commons. Click that. And that will take you to this website. And this is where the gold mine is. So there are two places to go to find information for us. So one of them would be eBooks. And let's say, you wanted to research more, you want to know more about the Enlightenment, so you could write about uh, my, um, dangerous liaisons. So let's we'll just do, click, put Enlightenment in there, hit Enter, and see what we see. Many of these are not going to have anything to do with us. Enlightenment, Zeal, Hudson Bay, Hudson Bay, that's not what we're looking for. I mean, it, it is the proper time period, but it's America, and, and that's not going to help us look at Enlightenment in Europe. Enlightenment East-West, now yeah, that probably has to do with this concept of enlightenment, which is a religious concept. It's not going to help us. But then you have Hume's skeptical enlightenment. Well, this is about Hume, uh, a writer in the enlightenment. Well, that may be helpful to you if, if you wanted to write about philosophy. Ah, and then you have something that definitely looks like it could help. But if you look up here for Hume's skeptical enlightenment, this says ebook. Here, this just says book. So you have to go to the library in order to get it, and you can't because college is closed. So we keep looking. And then we have Enlightenment, a, gene a genealogy. What was the Enlightenment? Though many scholars have attempted to solve this riddle. Dan Edelstein, 2010, fairly recent. Chicago, University of Chicago Press. This is an academic press, so you know that this is going to be an academic book. Looks like it may help us. So you click that link there. And it will take you, should take you, where you need to go. 
and there we are. And then you have a PDF full text that you can download, full download. I'm not sure. I, I think this would probably have to work with a, this um, Adobe software stuff to prevent copyright infringement. I'm not sure. Uh, or you could just read it here in your in your text. I mean, in your on your screen if you wanted to read it that way. So scholarly book, scholarly press. So we know it's a scholarly book. Um, can read it. You can read it uh, on your own on your computer. I'm going a little slow right now, but uh, at any rate, that's that's how you would be able to get to it. I hope you were able to see when I clicked into that new. Oh man, you're still looking at this. Ah, oh, I'm going to have to redo. Yeah, sorry, Kathy. I'm going to redo the whole thing. I think the problem is I'm sharing one tab. I'm going to just share my screen. Yep, let's just share the entire screen. Infinite recursion. Do, 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 do. Okay, whoops. So this is where I logged into. Make sure you can see that. Yep. Over here on the right-hand side, I'm not sure if you would have it in useful links. I, I hope you would. I'm, I'm assuming you would. But, you know, somewhere you should be able to find library and learning commons. And then you click on that. And that opens this screen. That that opens the screen up here at the top. You have a tab that says ebooks, and then what I was doing Lightman. And assuming, well, let's say you wanted to research, um, you know, more you want to know more about the Enlightenment, so that you could talk about the dangerous liaisons or talk about the work dangerous liaisons. And then I clicked on. Um, I clicked on this, and that took me to this page here where you could read the whole thing, or you could grab a PDF view. You may have to log in in a certain way. Hopefully, it would work right away, but um, uh, this is a pretty good uh, book on the Enlightenment. University of Chicago Press. We know that it is an academic article. That's what I was highlighting there. Yeah, I mean, you know that it's an academic press. You know that it's a good academic argument. Um, and that's what you're looking for. Now, let's say you didn't want a book, but you wanted an article. In order to get to the articles that I mention here in... Oops. In this, see, I say I recommend JSTOR. In order to get to that, oh, yeah, I need to click on Library Databases. And it will open eventually. I guess my computer doesn't like me doing all these. Probably my network does not like me doing all these things that I'm doing to it. Well, anyway, if and when it opens for you, generally I don't have a problem with this opening. Maybe something up with the site today. But if and when it opens for you, what you'll have is an alphabetized list. And you just click in the J section. Up at the top, you'll see the alphabet. Click on the J, and then you s scroll down into. Actually, I think it's the only entry, uh, J store, and that's the letter J S T O R. Click that, and that will take you to the um, version of J store that the college has access to. If you just Google J store, you're going to get to a version of J store that you don't have access to. So there are going to be a whole bunch of articles that you're not going to be able to get unless you pay a hundred bucks or something. It's outrageous. Um, you can go through the college website, however, and get whatever we have access to for, for free. 
those are PDF arg, um, articles. Ah, here we go. Those are PDF articles. Here we go. So here we could type in, oh, let's do my defaults. If they wanted another article on my defaults. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't read that one. That's from, oh, because it's from 1910. <laughs> so since it's from 1910, it's probably not going to be, you know, very important for you. But here's one from 1991, which is closer to us. Actually, I oh, know this isn't one of the ones I gave to you. So in order to get to it, you click download uh, PDF. And then it's going to ask you to say that, you know, follow the rules or whatever you click yes and then you can down it'll open up a new tab with the pdf there and then you can just download it to your computer or you can read it as is and these this is the type of scholar scholarly material that you need to be looking for notice this one too is 1898 i mean that modern language modern quarterly of language and literature is a very good one but 1898 you know, it's probably not going to It'd be interesting to read that. I should read it someday to see what they thought about it in the 19th century, but not going to be a, very helpful for you. So, do you have any questions for me? Blame it on Apple. Yeah, well, I should. This one's getting, I think this one's five years old now, so it's starting to get a, to be a bit of a pain. But my goodness, I, I will return to windows windows is it's, it's 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 brutal in its horribleness if i return to that side of the that side of the fence then i'm going for a linux machine or something i swear anyway outside of roger's quip about my machinery um does anyone have any questions about what's expected of you or or you know how to find the info um See, Elizabeth, you are typing, so I'll wait for a second. Oh, no questions. Okay, good. Um, so, um, the, oh, the only thing I wanted to clarify is how much I ask you, um, I expect for you to write uh, for the annotated bibliography. Really, a couple of sentences is perfectly fine. A couple of sentences for each one of your entries um, just saying, like I said, giving a general summary of what the article is about and then giving a, um, a, a quick statement about how you think that particular article or book or whatever it is you're using is going to help you in your analysis. And, and you don't have to know exactly how you're going to use it. You just give me an idea of how you think that you would use it. After you have done your annotated bibliography, if you decide that you want to change topics, that's perfectly fine. It's really not a problem for me. You're still going to have to do the research. So you'll just have to pick up another topic and, and do the research for that one. Um, but, uh, but yes, that's possible. Not a, not a problem. No worries. So any other questions on that? If not, then I think think we may be able to take a little bit of time to transition into, into the Enlightenment. Uh, and actually, while I'm, while I'm sitting here thinking about it, many of you already see it. We had some chatter earlier about Dangerous Liaison, so a number of you have already watched it, I take it? Okay. Okay. Well, for those of you who haven't, I think you'll probably enjoy it once you sit down. Enjoy it. You know, may not be your cup of tea, but you know, it's it's uh, easier to to watch that than read Ovid. <laughs> Put it that way. So um, good. No, oh, Genesis, you have seen it a while ago. Interesting. Um, you read. Claude Alaud Laclos book. It is a wonderful book. 
I'm wondering how did you get how did you read it? Was it part of a class or did you just pick it up because you wanted to read some 18th century French literature? Um, I picked it up after I saw the movie. I have a tendency of doing that. Like I'll I'll watch a movie and if I really if I know it's based off of a book or like there's something further, I just go and get it. I did that with like um the Hunger Games and stuff like that. So it's just a habit of mine. Okay. Well, it is a very readable book, I think you found probably. It it's a little bit yeah, 18th it's, it's, century. Yeah, it I I like it because it's like it's very it's very dramatic, so and it's all it's very like gossipy, and so it's it's a it's a pretty fun book actually. Yes, gossipy. Uh, and, I mean, you know, all these letters back and forth. Uh, it was it was very very gossipy and juicy. I think uh, on that level, but also you get a good sense of the imagery that you end up with in the film too, um, and all that brutality that the film shows. A cheese grater on my mind. That that is one of the most interesting descriptions of Ovid I think I've I've ever heard. Um, it is a uh, it's a it's an acquired taste. I I will put it that way. Um, and he's such a horrible person <laughs> that it makes it difficult to read. But you know, is what it is. So, well then, since a couple of you have seen it. And a couple of you have not. Um, we will. Uh, what we'll do is we will spend only about half an hour doing a deep analysis of the film for our next class. I really do want to take some time to get into Thomas Mann's Death in Venice and make sure that we have plenty of time to explain the, the many different themes that are very important to that. Meaning that you need to be reading Death in Venice uh, probably this week. Now, um, Death in Venice is just a story inside of the collection of stories that is called Death in Venice and Other Stories. Actually, I think it's called Death in Venice and Other Tales. In my copy of the book, it's the last of the stories. It looks like it's short, but for many, it takes quite a while to read. It's um, it's a dense read. Uh, it is very descriptive. It is, um, I think it's it's not as hard as Ovid by any stretch of the imagination. But there are a lot of allusions to classical works. There, it, it's a very descriptive novel, so it it can take a little bit longer to read than a than you may think. So try to get around to it this week if you can. Um, in order to get us there into the modern period from where we are now in the Middle Ages, there's a couple of stages uh, and important things that I want to make sure that we get over and, and some really dramatic changes that happen as well, including a transition from uh, the concept of beauty as a male concept or or that the man's body is beautiful into a concept of the woman's body as being beautiful in the middle ages no body physical body was really seen to em, embody uh, beauty it the, n human bodies were not beautiful in the middle ages they were as innocent the third talked about them they they were you know they rotted they they got old they fell apart they were evidence that we were fallen creatures that doesn't mean that no one saw other human beings as attractive that that's a silly statement but um the concept of a human body as being able to be beautiful would have been totally alien to medieval thinkers and medieval writers and many of the people in the Middle Ages. Desirous? Sure, that's fine. But beautiful? No. De angels are beautiful. Jesus is beautiful. That's it. Human beings are not. Um, so, but what happens is we move into the Renaissance is that at the early stage of the Renaissance, the male body is still beautiful. In fact, let me, uh, let me pull up a, some images here. Hang on one second. Uh, 
pictures. Good. I already have as a PDF. Statue of David. You're you're exactly where I was. I was going to start talking about Genesis. Exactly right. Statue of David is one of those. The the two statues of David that I'm have in my uh, presentation are those. Presentation. And uh, we're just going to take a quick look at uh, some of the images and talk briefly about some of the major shifts. And, and then I'll do, I'll record a, a lecture uh, on top at giving some more details about a lot of these things. There's a, a large swath of history, of art history, of intellectual history that we're covering in, in a very, very short period of time. Almost all of it is really important for Thomas Mann, though, because he is so, he's a very educated person and he, and he, he, he borrows a lot of imagery. He uses that imagery. He uses what he expects to be common knowledge in the mind of his reader to build on ideas. Some of it will be very familiar to you because you've read Plato and you've read, in fact, the exact, uh, the exactly appropriate Plato to understand some of the concept that he, concepts that he's talking about. But, you know, some of them which tap into Romanticism as a movement in the 19th century and um, the Enlightenment uh, may be a bit difficult. So, like I said, I'm going to skip through a number of these. Because what I really want to get to is that dude, right? That's one of the Davids, and that's another of the Davids. 1504, 14... 90, 93, is that, is that right? Uh, Donatello, Donatello, David, two of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, by the way. I don't think we're going to see all of them because I don't have anything in here on Leonardo. So too bad. I, I'm doing a, a quick, uh, quick look up here. No, I'm sorry, 1440, much earlier than I remembered. 1440. So 1440, 1504, many years apart. Um, they are, um, you can see the nudity in the two of them. Now, it, it is, of course, a statue of David. And in the story, David removes all of his armor, so it's reasonable for the artist to put the nude body. But Donatello here is effectively making a copy of some Roman classical works of art that he would have seen um, in, on his trips to Rome in order to study classical art. And so he's, he's just borrowing a Roman male body here. The long hair indicates that this is a very young man. And so we get into this um, this Athenian concept of the beauty of the young man's body. Michelangelo has a different point of view. You still have the nude body, but his body is definitely a, a little bit of an older man, uh, you know, but still 20 or something. Whereas here we're looking at like 16, I guess, I, I, just you know, looking at the face, the hair, the long hair in Roman statues was oftentimes an indication of a very young man. Uh, pre-age of growing a beard. I'm not sure if that's what Donatello is after for this one. But here Michelangelo uh, turns him into quite a bit of an older man. Like I said, 20, 22, something like that. 0% body fat. Notice that you have these soft curves here. A lack of, of real detail in the muscle because that's not the important part. It looks as though that sword is too heavy for him to even be able to lift uh, in order to lop off Goliath's head. Whereas here, uh, this dude could crush your head with his one hand or something. It's like soccer star type of 0% body fat. There's a reason for this because this statue is meant to signify a republic um this was a uh this was a, a brief moment 
of a return to freedom for Florence it was a, a republic again. It had been a republic for hundreds of years before, and then the Medici family had effectively taken over things, and then they kicked the Medici out, and they reclaimed the republic, and this was the statue to represent that, so this image of power. But eventually, you will get to the same statue, and unfortunately, I don't think I have a copy of Bernini, Bernini's David here, uh, but I, I recommend you take a look at it. Bernini's David is the same topic, but he's clothed. He's not clothed. He's nude, but a cape that he has or a, a sash or something has just so happened to swirl around his waist and covered up his genitals. So he is nude, but it's, you know, we don't see his nudity. This is part of the counter-reformation art movement uh, and, and a desire to remove nudity of any sort really from the church. But what has also happened is a new approach to women. I don't want to, Raphael's album Madonna is one of the greatest works ever, and I would love to spend a lot of time on it. But we have one uh, representation of woman as mother, but educated. And then we move to the Venus of Urbino. And this is really the beginning, and, and this isn't the beginning, but this signals, this is a statue of Venus by, not a statue, a painting of Venus by Titian's teacher, whose name I can't remember now. Uh, somebody's found Bernini's David. Check it out. But there's a, stat, there's a painting by Titian's teacher of Venus laid out in exactly the same way. Um, but what Titian does is he turns a, a young wife, the wife of the Duke of Urbino, into Venus in the nude, but in the process of getting dressed. And this signals the real transition from the male body being a representation of human beauty to the female body being the representation of human beauty and the male body, as, as you'll see if you look at Bernini, is the representation of power and activity. There's very little in the way of passive, passivity in representations of male bodies from here on out. Women's bodies are passive. They are laying out. They are relaxed. They are powerless. And that's the image that, that's almost the universal truth for women from this moment up until, well, you know, yesterday <laughs> or even today. Um, the emphasis that we place on the female body as being an image of beauty and the male body still to this day as being an image of power and activity. Um, so that really begins here in the Renaissance. A couple of things about the Venus of Urbino. Um, a game is going on that is very important for art, and that game is the artist has given you a peek inside of a private world that is um, about to come to an end. So you, he's giving you a peek into her nudity, but she is not completely nude, and she is not just laying out in the nude. Um, instead, she's in the process, she's partially dressed, and she's in the process of getting dressed. So her partial dress is she has a bracelet, she has earrings, her hair is up, she has a ring on her other hand that I'm not going to point to. Um, all of these, you know, you may think well, that's not clothing, that's not being dressed, but for the artist and for the viewer of this, that is, that's a state of being prepared to be dressed. She's just waiting for those servants over here in the background to come put her clothes on her. And so there's this game of us being given a, a private image. Of course, this would have been intended for the husband, a painting for the husband to be placed in their home and not for public view. He's given him, the artist has given him a, a private little peek into a private world. Notice that her body, most of her body is hidden behind a curtain. We're on the other side of that curtain. And there's also deep symbolism, which is, also very typical of paintings with women's bodies. 
The red of the couch conflicts with the white. White, of course, means purity, virginity. Red means passion and lust. The flowers are related to Venus. That plant is related to Venus as well. So it's a plant that the Romans used to signal or symbolize Venus. Um, the fact that the sheet here is being pulled back from the red passion underneath shows this tension between her purity and her virginity and her passion buried beneath. Yes, Roger, it's sea myrtle. Um, this passion buried beneath that's been going to be revealed as her purity and virginity is revealed. The puppy signifies the same concept. Um, dogs are symbols of lust because they're an animal and animals can't control their desire. So they're a symbol of, of raw lust. They're also the symbol of deep loyalty because a dog is very loyal to you. Um, this dog here is asleep, and so that signals that her lust is asleep and her loyalty is asleep. But someone's going to come along to waken the little puppy, and that is, of course, the husband. And that's the idea of marriage here in the 16th century for the Titian and the Venus of Urbino, that the husband is going to come along and, and reveal her passion, reveal her lust, and tie it to her loyalty to him. Uh, she is asleep, effectively, and she will be awakened by the husband. That becomes, it doesn't really become, it, it has been for a while. Uh, you see that in some medieval literature. And it is the way it is well up into the 19th century. Um, but this idea of the female body as being an image of beauty is is also making its way into art uh, as we roll through towards the Enlightenment. Um, Protestant Revolution happens, absolutism happens. I'll detail this more later. Um, this concept is somewhat influential, I, I would say, on the 18th century concept of, of sexuality. Uh, what you have here is the depiction of what is called rape, um, not the sexual violation. The word rape initially meant kidnapping, primarily kidnapping a woman, and the idea of the sexual violation that would happen inevitably afterwards was kind of hidden in the word, but the word really meant the kidnapping. Um, and so what's happening here, the rape of the Sabine women, is that these women are being kidnapped by the Roman Now, the Roman Empire was essential to European thought of itself. If the Roman Empire had never existed, Europe would never exist, according to European thought, right? It is the paragon of Roman, I mean, of European history. It, it sits there as something that everybody's going to want to rebirth, right? Um, Hitler wanted to rebirth the Roman Empire. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Napoleon wanted to rebirth the Roman Empire. All of them want, want to reclaim this, this, by this point, very mythical Roman Empire. And so the fact that the Romans are the ones doing the raping here, kidnapping these women away, indicates that this is a positive thing for the artist and for the viewer. But this has to happen. But you look at this and you see the violence and you see the the uh, something that's quite off-putting about it. Um, but that shows, I mean, because these, you know, these babies and these old women are going to be murdered after all. Uh, one of the reasons they're there. You can see this guy's arm extended so he can bring it down quite dramatically into the throat of the old man who's trying to hold him off. So the slaughter and the rape are seen as they're vi as violent, are shown as being uh, quite horrible. But then you have this static figure up here in the corner looking out over everyone, almost as a, a philosopher or a ruler looking out over his servants, over his citizens. And that distinction between this raw, ugly violence down here and this quiet, static image 
reassures the viewer that the violence has to happen for a reason. If these women had not been stolen away, according to Roman myth, then the Romans themselves would never have continued. Their wives had all died or something. And so they had to cap kidnap these women, take them back to keep all alive at the very, very beginning of the world. So the conflict, the violence, the ugliness is balanced by the necessity, according to Medi uh, 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 Renaissance, 18th century, 17th century thought here. And at the same time as this painting is done, um, a number of kings around Europe have declared themselves absolutist kings. Uh, and they declare this as a way of, of centralizing their power, that they have power over everything in their kingdom, um, defending that their own power against the Catholic Church and defending it from, from others who want to meddle in their affairs as well, mostly religious meddling. And at the same time, they are making a statement to their people that they are the absolute ruler and whatever they determine is right and good must be by its nature because they have determined it must be good, not just for themselves as the ruler, but for everyone, because they embody the state. Uh, I think it was Louis XIII who said, moi, c'est l'état, meaning I am the state. And so whatever he determines for his own body, for his own, his own self, is for the good of everyone. And so that means, that means for the citizens, they Every citizen, man and woman, are like these women. They must yield to the violence that's being enacted upon them, assuming that it does happen. They have to yield for the good of everyone, for the good of the state. And that sense of yielding for the good is perverted by La Marquise de Merteuil in Dangerous Liaisons. And if, like Genesis read the novel, you can see that she plays on these games regularly. That history is a fiction for her. She uses history. She uses this imagery from history as a way of, of playing with her subjects, quote unquote, the men and women who are around her. And so this idea of the woman yielding for the good of the state becomes to some extent like um, Cecile, the young girl in Dangerous Liaisons, when you watch the movie, yielding for the good of La Marquise de Marteuil and her vengeance. Um, I think it's a good parallel. There's another rape narrative. Pluto and Proserpina was very popular. Now, rape narratives were also popular in art because of the tension that you get between the bodies. So there's a visual component that makes them kind of attractive. Yes, Genesis, yes. Not to give too much away for those who haven't seen the movie, but you're absolutely right. That's what Mr. Meta is doing. Um, but this attractiveness of the conflict between the two bodies is also built on the notion of the softness and the beauty of the male of the woman's body blended together with the hardness and the uh, activity of the male body. That's one of the reasons that these, for the artist at any rate, these narratives of raping and kidnapping were very, very popular. That's um, a Bernini work, by the way, because he's he was pretty astonishing. That's a, a side view of the same Bernini work. You can see how her flesh is dimpled by his rigid fingers clamping into her. And you should also be mindful that this is all carved into one solid chunk of rock. <laughs> that, is, that is pretty amazing because Bernini was amazing. But anyway, so we move into the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment is really uh, the. And I know we only have five. I'm going to be able to describe the entirety of the Enlightenment to you in the five minutes that we have, but um, to give you those of you who want to watch the movie uh, in the near future, to give you an idea of the background for La Marquise de Merteuil and her manipulation and her her process of um, of pleasure, seeking pleasure. What she is. Um, 
what she is working around here is this enlightenment world, which prizes rationality and reason um, above all things, above emotion for sure. Um, it is the beginning of large scale social education. You know, public education begins in the enlightenment. So we are all children of the enlightenment in that way. Uh, things like sociology and anthropology begin in the enlightenment. Um, in other words, looking at human beings as objects to study rather than as divine spiritual beings or whatever, but just looking at them as human objects to go around and study. That idea begins in the 18th century. Scientific revolution begins in the 17th century, but really is a mainstream idea and obsession in the 18th century during the Enlightenment. And this concept of scientific experimentation, you can see also kind of being a part of the narrative of dangerous liaisons, the way the Marquise de Merteuil experiments on those, um, her again, her sort of subjects who flock around her. The Enlightenment is one of these moments, too, that knew what it was. It knew that it was somehow different than other periods. It knew it was a movement. And Immanuel Kant, a very important um, uh, 18th and 19th century philosopher, uh, summed up in 1784 what the Enlightenment was in a phrase, in a passage that is a cornerstone of many, many philosophical and, and historical texts. And that is that Enlightenment isn't just a movement, but it's about an emergence from what he calls a self-incurred immaturity. Um, and that this immaturity is um, self-incurred because effectively we don't want to use our own reasoning to think through things according to uh, concepts that we should, you know, we should know or we should have intuited, and build on that, and 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 like I said, think through it. Um, I normally like to read a bit in the Enlightenment, uh, this to you in, in German, but I can't, for the life of me, fall my, find my copy. One of the reasons I like to do it is because of his term that he uses, Aufklärung, which is the German word for Enlightenment. Um, and the fact, the idea that Aufklärung means uh, a little bit, I mean, if you know anything about the Enlightenment, then you know that you know, this is built into the sense of the Enlightenment as well. But Aufklärung in German means to light something up or to bring it into the light, to make it clear. And that's the word that he's using. And I actually found the translation here. Aufklärung ist der Ausgang des Menschen aus seiner selbstverschuldenen Unmündigkeit. Unmündigkeit ist das Unvermögen, sich seines Verstandes ohne Leitung eines anderen zu bedienen. Selbstverschuldet ist diese Unmündigkeit, wenn die Ursache derselben nicht am Mangel des Verstandes, sondern der Entschließung und des Mutes liegt, sich seiner ohne Leitung eines anderen zu bedienen. Sapire aude, habe Mut, dich deines eigenen Verstandes zu bedienen, ist also der Wahlspruch der Aufklärung. So, there you go. I just use some German for the evening. Um, that sense of Aufklärung means to bring things into the light, and our immaturity prevents us from, according to him, bringing things into the light unless we use our reason without having other people tell us what the meaning is, without having other people tell us this is the answer, that we simply use our reason to guide ourselves. This is an obsession for this period. Now, as you're watching the movie, think about how La Marquise de Merteuil uses her reason. She uses her reason in manipulation. And so there is a moral question, I think, that um, Claude de Lod de la Claude brings to the story. It makes us think about the use of reason isn't necessarily an innately moral thing to do. That if it's used for immoral ends, that's a bad thing. Well, 
I hope you enjoy watching the movie. Uh, we will talk much more about it. We'll talk a bit more about it on uh, Monday of next week. And also start talking about Freud. We will talk about Freud on Monday of next week as well. Uh, so that we can um, get get our grapples, get our fingers into uh, Thomas Mann's Death in Venice. There is one other movie to watch. And if, so if you want to go ahead and watch that one, if you've got some time on your hands, the link is also available in that same section that I showed you where the link is for uh, Dangerous Liaisons. It is a, a word of warning for that movie. It's called In a Year with 13 Moons. If you are watching this at home around children, you may want to send them out for a particular scene that takes place in a slaughterhouse where you, they do show animals, a cows being slaughtered right in front of you. And this is a real active slaughterhouse. So it can be a bit overwhelming. Um, we'll talk about it more. And if you want to cover your eyes for that part and you know not pay attention to what's going on, that's fine. I'll describe what happens in that. But we will uh, we'll deal with that in week seven, which is only two weeks away. So try to take some time to uh, sit down and watch that one sooner rather than later. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Have a lovely week. And I look forward to reading more of all of your work. Bye-bye. Au revoir. Tschüss. Wiedersehen. Good night.